Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so wonderful to be here. Um, I um, I am basically what you can call it. Um, definitely a consumer psychologist, also a fashion psychologist, um, human brands expert, um, lots of different things. Basically, um, my work uh, within my consultancy includes um, assisting various consumer brands mostly across retail, hospitality and tech um, in, on brand strategy, customer experience, uh, innovation, and really kind of ensuring that behaviorally um, all of their designs, uh, behaviors, uh, experiences across all of their channels, all of their brand designs as well, are actually effective and are making uh, the best kind of representation of the brand and are delivering really the most enriching potential um, experience to the customers as well. Um, the mission within our business is really to work um, on creating a better world by making brands more human. Um, so I'm very much um, aligned with working with brands that truly want to make something different and whether that's five minutes of joy uh, for someone or whether that's actually enhancing uh, how we think about sustainable or ethical business, which is, for example, um, a type of um, project that we are currently actually working together with White Bear on, uh, on developing a new sustainable and ethical fashion brand, um, launching early next year. So what's the space? Um, but yeah, but we worked with guys like Swarovski, our wonderful client also is Dowsing and Reynolds, we're a homeware retailer uh, from Leeds, um, and we worked across lots of things from the design of their first ever store and now a lot of kind of strategic considerations. We worked with Snack, um, Sofa in a box company. They, um, we, we worked with them since before they launched and then um, in a subsequent um, sort of revamps and strategy. So loads of different kind of similar clients like that. I'm also a lecturer at London College of Fashion, uh, Regents University and L Education. Um, yeah, so all the time busy, all the time happy, um, all the time joyful with, you know, and grateful for the type of clients I have. Um, doesn't matter whether they startups, scale ups or global, it's more for us about what difference can we make in the world. So hopefully that's enough of an introduction. <laughs> yeah, what a client list too. That's amazing. Okay, well, I'd love to get stuck right in because I have some questions for you. And I'd like to start with what were some major consumer behavior shifts that you have been seeing before the pandemic and how, if they have been affected by the pandemic? So one kind of key aspect is definitely individualism um, and really an ability to express it in a quite a unique and specific way. And that hasn't changed, that actually only intensified through um, the pandemic. Because we were able to have much more time for introspection, for really understanding what's important to us, how we want to live our life, who we even are and really kind of that self-awareness um, has grown considerably and what that simply means is that we are uh, naturally going to look for brands that are allowing us to quite uniquely express who we are and the trouble with that is that if you look across majority of the brands, you know, the ones that Viber is creating, uh, the majority of them is a sea of sameness. Um, the same products, uh, the same fabrics, the same prices, the same designs, um, no different symbolic meaning, nothing. I'm like, majority of it is bloody boring. Let's just be honest. Um, and in a normal kind of busy daily life pre-pandemic we didn't even have a headspace to notice um you know how disturbing that is to us and but because we had so much of that time for introspection that differentiation between brands which is mostly non-existent has become so apparent to us that we at the moment will be truly looking for things that are considerably different and that's really where especially amazing startups d2c startups um, with really special um, message with a unique kind of differentiation will be key so the second thing is definitely belongingness 
it's not going anywhere. It has been super strong, mostly due to tech. So tech actually was fairly detrimental to our belongingness. Yes, it helped us to connect with people in a wider scale across the wider world, but actually it um, basically made our relationship shallow uh, and made them super instant as opposed to um, intimate and intimacy demands time to build. Um, and the same thing goes for consumer and brand relationships. We kind of expected very much of a sort of instant relationship, instant, you know, uh, personal and intimate reactions and behaviors from brands without actually realizing that it doesn't work like that because it's exactly the same like in human relationships. Um, we need that time and that time is also what makes those relationships beautiful what makes them actually create better value. Sorry, I've got some of my cats here. <laughs> <laughs> they go everywhere. Um, so, um, so that kind of, you know, intimacy that then builds a much stronger relationships and therefore builds much better belongingness is something that was already a strong driver, maybe not something that would have been obviously told to you by your customers, but they would have shown an interest. They wouldn't want it to impact your brand. They would have wanted to vote on your next steps. Um, so all the kind of aspects of co-creation and collaboration are a sign of, you know, of, an, uh, of a need for impact and intimacy with the brand. And definitely that also stems from the fact that obviously tech um, hasn't helped us with fulfillment of our basic need of belongingness. And that also includes human relationships, right? So uh, it's super hard to build amazing kind of, you know, techs, um, tech solutions, apps and whatever else to actually create um, deep relationships um, and create those relationships based on a much sort of longer term um, development of um you know of that intimacy as opposed to that kind of instant um you know much um so the trouble with that was that we started then trying to fulfill that belongingness in other forms and another way that therefore we did that is trying to join join brand communities However, historically, brands have been really rubbish at creating those, um, except a few kind of great examples. Um, but actually, you know, the science, the, you know, the best practice from some of the most amazing brands um, have shown that brand communities are a super tool in terms of building loyalty, engagement, um, word positive word of mouth um all those kind of different things obviously long-term customer value all of those kind of benefits are super important however the way that kind of communities have been managed and built and created by the brands has not really been very strategic majority of the times so we've been actually very lucky to be working with some of our clients on brand community strategies uh, for the last kind of year or so and uh, I've also been asked to, to write an article to journal brand strategy on brand communities uh, and actually ended up uh, somehow coming up with uh, a model for a, a much more holistic multiple brand retailer um, communities. So really kind of, you know, making sure that we include and understand and strategize relationships across different members and actors within those brand communities, not just customers. Um, and that's kind of a bit of a challenging thing because usually those brand communities are very much about kind of creating another channel for communication with the customer um, and just kind of more, more often than not spamming them with content that, you know, rather than actually creating a conversation and a relationship because that's what, the, what it kind of should be at the beginning. So, one thing that we definitely noticed through all of that research and all of the work with our clients and communities is that beyond the authenticity and experience, the, um, the community is actually the next biggest differentiator for brands. And those brands that are not going to properly jump on a wagon of creating those communities in a 
much better, much more strategic way and understanding how they can really positively impact their business. Um, not just kind of in terms of sales, but actually in terms of things like co-creation or collaboration or, um, you know, um, or kind of build up of a following or anything like that. Um, they really kind of going to miss out on those things. Um, yeah, I think those are the kind of two major stuff, uh, obviously. Um, yeah, we obviously also have a conversation around sustainability all the time, uh, which fortunately, I'm, you know, as much as we don't want pandemics, um, pandemics and kind of any other existential threats are amazing, um, you know, in making us sort of reevaluate our life. Um, and according to something called terror management theory, and when we are reminded uh, of our mortality, so precisely what we have to face every single day right now uh, for the last few months, uh, we have a tendency to react in two different ways. Um, so we either become more impulsive and indulgent. I think we've all experienced it. A little bit too many paper rolls, a little bit too much wine, a little bit too much chocolate, and all this kind of bits and pieces, right? Um, or we can become more, more, uh, more moral and prosocial. So, and the aspect of sustainability and ethical business, or even what we have been seeing with Black Lives Matter, is that kind of other angle of uh, reaction. And there's plenty of um, research that shown that previous existential threat has actually uh, had a tendency to enhance the likelihood um, of buying or at least engaging with more sustainable kind of ethical generally good for the world and people businesses so those are probably kind of the three major things um, that are happening uh, and that are will certainly going to happen uh, continuously thanks yeah it sounds i think the one silver lining from this pandemic has that it does give you that headspace to look back and really try to understand what your consumer wants and just like your own personal life but it's kind of understanding your professional life too and understanding why does my consumer even like my brand and then how can i adapt to that so it's there is a silver lining to it i think or oh, sometimes it's better not to ask them why they like it um <laughs> you need to be way more strategic. People are absolutely rubbish in understanding what is actually happening in their mind. Uh, so you guys know very well because you work with me, but probably not the audience. Um, the majority of our decisions, about 95% of human decisions are made entirely subconsciously. And we make about 30 to 40,000 decisions a day. And the reason we are able to even do that is because our subconscious brain is able to process 11 million bits of information per second. And that's process, not just perceive. Process means I perceived it, I analyzed it, I understood the meaning, I made a decision, I probably even took an action, and I have absolutely no awareness that I just did that. Uh, that's how it works. That's why if you ask people uh, what they actually feel, what they do with whatever, it's not going to work. Uh, you need to be much more strategic. So one thing we, for example, did with one of our clients recently was um, in, in helping kind of revamp their brand strategy. We've actually ended up creating a completely personalized to them brand personality questionnaire um, because the sort of standard one um, developed by scientists just wasn't talking well enough for them. But we, uh, we like to always kind of, as much as we can and as much as is possible, um, to actually check with both employees and customers how they rate the brand across those things. So if you give them those kind of specific words and just a rating, it becomes a little bit more intuitive and therefore much more driven by the subconsciousness in those responses. They become kind of less judgmental in how they're rating those things. It's still not a perfect solution. There's lots more other cool methods to do that but it's good enough and the results are always um super useful super interesting um especially in really kind of understanding how honestly people are viewing uh your brand um and whether you need to sort of adjust uh, certain strategies or behaviors or communication to make sure that um those uh, kind of characteristics those aspects of your brand that are more important to you are more front and center um, rather than perhaps not being rated as well as you wanted it. Mm -hmm. How do you actually create a brand that is aligned with the human mind? 
because it seems like such a complicated space, the human mind. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so for majority of the people will be like, oh my goodness, I don't even know where to start. Um, but obviously, you know, I've learned for so many years. Um, I've studied it. I've read all this stuff. I've practiced it on many clients. So for me, it's, um, it's much, you know, it's much more kind of, um, it's easier basically. Um, I sometimes I just know, um, and obviously, you know, most of my, I just know it's simply my mind processed a lot of different things, use my knowledge from the, everything. And then I also triple check it with additional research, but to make it super simple is first of all, brands are perceived by a brain as a human being literally <clears throat> there's actual neuroscientific studies that show to us that um, the information that we store about brands uh, are exactly the same types of information that we store about human beings and we store them in exactly the same parts of our brain so that's basically a neuroscientific stick for brands and human beings exactly the same two entities really not a difference so that's why we are so passionate about making brands more human um, as well. So that includes things like, you know, personalities, behaviors, um, loads kind of aspects of emotions um, that are, that need to be kind of associated with the brand and spread carefully and strategically across different channels and journey steps. Um, then there is definitely the understanding of how that subconscious mind works and making sure that we basically intuitively create little tiny elements in design, in sort of behavior, or even in how you move your finger across the website. I'm like, even things like that really matter. Um, and we obviously we understand all of that research and we additionally at every single project research more and more and more and more just to be kind of you know, triple sure. And it's, you know, for us, then it becomes absolutely super easy, but it's, you know, it's that really understanding how the mind works, making sure that the brand kind of behaves and sounds and looks more like human. And that, you know, that actually humans are also representing it when it feels right for the brand as well, not always. Uh, making sure that, um, you know, that you have a strategy for creating relationships as well. So there's lots of amazing kind of research around um, consumer brand relationships and incredible models that we tend to like to use as well. Uh, all the communities are right for some brands, not for others. Um, so that's important. Now, the one thing that we always make sure as well is how the brand is really fulfilling human basic needs. So the Maslow's um, pyramid of human basic needs, because brands don't actually sell products or services. They don't even sell brands. They purely sell fulfillment of those basic needs based on a symbolism and a meaning that they are projecting with their design, with their communication, with their marketing. That's why it's super important to kind of at the beginning understand a lot of this stuff. So when we work on this kind of strategies, we, we go through all of this kind of different things. Um, obviously, we have a smaller versions, bigger versions, depending on, you know, on the demand and the, and the, um, and the requirements and the specific what's actually needed for them at this time. But those kind of basic things, it's, you know, really making sure that your brand behaves, sounds, looks more like a human, uh, that it speaks, um, that it creates relationships more like a human. And that's why I also mentioned intimacy or community. Um, and that you understand really at every single little decision um, how the mind works. And, you know, and that's where we kind of also um, advise brands across kind of different things, whether it's a bigger project, whether that's on a sort of glowing monthly, um, and sort of engagements and it's, it's beautiful when we sort of are able to build a relationship with the brands because then they have those amazing foundations but you know they want to for example launch a campaign uh, a new campaign but then there is you know just not the right word in there or there's slight kind of you know placement of something on the poster or something else that needs to be there or the idea perhaps is not going to be as effective considering their customer profiles and considering what they actually need to change in a brand perception 
So, you know, so for us, it's super easy. We can kind of look at it and sometimes, you know, within a few minutes, an hour, sometimes a half a day, sometimes more, depending on the, you know, complexity of it, we are able to, you know, to really kind of pinpoint which way you need to change things. And you know that, guys, you know, we've been kind of giving you those sort of um, feedbacks on some of the designs. Um, fortunately, there's hardly, you know, things to change with, you know, with your work. Um, so that's why I love working with you. But, um, you know, but nevertheless, it's much easier um, that way because the band is much more consistent, much more aligned because everything it it feels right and consistency is necessary for the brain because you know subconsciousness absolutely totally hates conflict conflict means lack of trust uh conflict means lack of authenticity as soon as there's consistency trust and authenticity work together um so that's why those kind of super tiny sensory little details of the brand you might not be able to realize that they're important. You probably won't even necessarily notice them. Your customer won't be able to tell you about them because they won't perceive them consciously. But subconsciously, it's this kind of, I don't know what it's about this place, or about this product. I just don't like it. I'm going to leave. You don't really know what happened. Whereas for us, it's like, okay, so you should have moved to that over here. Then, you know, this color should be changed over this way. Then this shape needed to be that way. Then the music is not the right one. Just change it to that one. Then you need to use that sentence to welcome the customer. Oh, please remove that bloody pop-up window. Um, you know, every, you know, in the first two seconds that I'm entering the website, because that's already intimacy building and all this kind of, you know, things sometimes super detailed and sometimes a little bit bigger are super easy for us to notice because obviously we've been you know we know that knowledge we've been doing it for years um so it's you know but the the difference especially when you kind of add those little changes it's amazing i'm like you know obviously our clients you know testimonials will be able to tell you um i see we have a question what are some practical activities a startup on a budget can carry out to better understand their customer psyche? Oh, cool. Good one. I like it. Um, but do you, um, Anne, can you tell us, you already have some social media following. That's okay. I have been noticing a little bit, just to give um, Anne some A little feedback. bit of a delay, yeah? A little bit of feedback from your speaker, unless it's me, but... Um, just trying to make sure that nothing's in the way of your speaker, maybe. I don't know what it is. The connection's fine. No, that's fine. I don't know. I'm, nothing is in the way of my speaker. It's just on the laptop. So, um, so Anne, responding to your question, if you have already a social media following, some of the super easiest thing um, to do is look at some of your most engaged customers and their profiles and look at what are they posting. Um, so you can quite easily figure out things like interests and values. So if majority of the posts, for example, are about family, then uh, it's very likely that their highest value is family. If majority of the posts are, for example, about eating out and going out, whatever else, and sort of like friends and entertainment and experiences. So it allows you to understand that kind of her, your body allows you to understand um, partially uh, how you need to communicate your products or your services. So you can, for example, sell exactly the same uh, black dress, but that black dress can be communicated in a way that, uh, for example, says that you will have more content in your career and, uh, for example, you know, uh, your child will be super proud uh, of the mommy at the school gates because she's the most beautiful one. Or you can, for example, say it's super limited edition, only worn by, um, you know, by the best um, uh, kind of actors and celebrities and whatever else, and there's only five of them left, then uh, probably the value of your, um, of your customers is much more to do with status um, and fame. So it just, you know, it's exactly the same piece of product, but it's how you kind of envelop it. Now, you're also going to be able to quite easily see their personality from that. So, for example, if, they're, uh, if things that they're wearing uh, or the, you know, their house or places that they choose to kind of spend time in and take pictures of are quite vibrant and vivid and there's a lot of people and there's a lot of buzz and things like that, 
then they're much more likely extroverted. And if they're much quieter, then they're much more introverted. If they also, all of their pictures are super organized and there's always clean and there's lots of kind of details also that they are um, picturing, then they're much more likely to be highly conscientious. So that means very attentive to detail, very organized, very specific, uh, love their routines and rituals. Uh, so that means that your brand, brand, for example, will need to be much clearer and much more, um, there needs to be kind of much more clarity in your design and in, um, in those things. And you need to sort of accentuate the, the detail of the product and the sort of unique kind of elements of a design. Um, also, um, if, for example, um, they are always kind of talking about kindness and compassion and collaboration and harmony and um, they love kind of, you know, commenting on everyone and supporting kind of in that kind of very sort of supportive mode, commenting on everyone's posts and things like that, then they're very likely highly agreeable. Uh, and highly agreeable individuals are super useful in terms of co-creation, collaboration and personalization. They are the best people to kind of rally in everyone, make sure that everyone's voice is heard of, um, that um, you know that they actually going to um, to be helpful uh, in you know let's say if you kind of going to decide to do some voting on your next steps or I don't know a new color of the fabric to introduce next season or something like that. So those will be kind of the individuals to then, for example, reach out to, um, especially if they're also extroverted because they very likely will have a strong social capital. I hope that helps a little bit. Obviously, it's a um, you know. It's a beginning, but if you just take even a cross section of 10 of your most engaged customers, uh, then that will give you already quite a strong um, feedback. Great. What about sustainability or mindful consumption? Are you customers, customers more or less interested in that now? So um, a little bit more, obviously, as I said earlier with that, uh, with the mortality salience. So that kind of helps a little bit. However, the challenge with sustainability and ethical consumption is that it's still not front and center um, for everyone in terms of it being at a driver. So it's not the major, the first driver of any kind of consumer decisions. Uh, the reason for that being is that obviously sustainability, ethical, mindful of any kind of consumption is uh, a representation of the highest um, level of Maslow's needs, which is self-transcendence. This is the only level which is not focused on me, 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 me. Yeah, it's the only level that starts actually, we want to start giving back. But if you look at it honestly, majority of the people in the world uh, are not simply partially due to their circumstances, partially, you know, due to kind of, you know, what's, uh, what's the environment expecting of them, uh, or even resources to be able to kind of grow as a human being are not really at that level of, um, you know, of the development. And also with the pandemic, um, some of our most basic needs such as safety and belongingness have been threatened. So obviously they will become the major um, driver of our decisions. And if uh, on top of it, we can, you know, get things like sustainability and ethical, then it's like, a, oh, that's a nice to have. But the first kind of type of communication should be through all those other lower level um, um, Maslow's needs. So whether that's through, you know, mostly kind of belongingness and self-actualization. So self-actualization is really about kind of enriching experiences, but also about sort of reaching your fullest potential and things like well-being and spirituality kind of form into that. So if you kind of communicating um, sustainability or ethical business or kind of you know even mindful consumption through those two key um needs because they most aligned uh with you know with what we kind of need uh people to do then um then it will be much more effective so it's almost like that sustainability and ethical aspect is an added value it's a nice to have thing it's a cherry on a cake um, as opposed to the first major thing there's a very small percentage of consumers that are very happy to, you know, to have sustainability, ethical and mindful consumption at the forefront of their decision making. But it's not a lot of them. So if you're looking for a little bit bigger volume, you need to start a conversation with a different value offering and then add a sustainability as an additional thing. 
Gotcha. So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about brand communities lately. I know you touched on it um, earlier. We also did an event on it recently. And so um, has the importance of brand communities been affected by the pandemic? Yes, certainly. So because obviously belongingness has been threatened um, and we have not been able to really kind of have um, such a good relationships with our friends and family or to simply even be able to take part in communities that we would have normally, such as go out to a store even, because that's some level of experiencing belongingness, being able to observe other customers and you know, see what's happening and who's buying what and, you know, all these kind of things. Um, we weren't able to go for events or for yoga class or, you know, to all these kind of things that, you know, we took for granted. But there were to some degree, in a small percentage, but they were kind of fulfilling some aspect of, you know, of our belongingness. And obviously, when we added them all up, we were quite okay. You know, maybe we weren't perfect because some of us, didn't have romantic relationships or didn't have such a best friend, you know, or whatever. We didn't kind of spend as much time on them. Uh, but we were okay. We weren't like, you know, we didn't have that urgency to be able to fulfill those needs. But, you know, but obviously some um, still individuals were already before the pandemic heavily impacted by loneliness and social isolation, which clearly have been considerably intensified uh, due to the necessity of it through the pandemic, um, which is not great. Um, and there's a lot of research showing that uh, individuals that are um, lonely and socially isolated have a tendency to prefer kind of more humanized or more anthropomorphized brands. Um, obviously, that isn't fulfilling um, to the strongest degree their actual needs for, um, for belongingness and therefore isn't a cure for loneliness and social isolation. Uh, and especially that majority of those kind of brands are then not going to follow through and actually foster social interactions and relationships for their customers. Whereas there already has been research a few years ago looking at just simply asking customers, you know, wh what they want kind of from brands and things like that. And one of those things was that they want um, the brands to foster those relationships, including things like matchmaking. And I'm not talking about dating apps. I'm talking about normal the fashion or a beauty brand or some retailer, or whatever else. I'm like, you know, let me meet a romantic partner because I have no bloody clue where else to do it because the apps don't work and, you know, and it's too scary to just say hello to someone in the street or in a bar or whatever else, right? So we have been already expecting brands before then to do that for us. But throughout the pandemic, some of the only places we could have actually potentially find some new or, you know, or enhance our relationships were through brands. Because if you look at it honestly, brands are absolutely everywhere in our life. They are in every relationship we have. They are in every corner of our house. They are in every part of our mind. They absolutely exist everywhere. Whether we realize it or not, their communication, their marketing, is impacting how we think, how we build our mindset, how we build our societies. And brands historically did not take a responsibility for that. Yes, they took it occasionally as an opportunity, but they did not take a responsibility for the fact that they are inevitably building our humanity. So we will be obviously expecting brands to connect us, to create those communities, to build those social relationships, but we also will be expecting them to be much more responsible in how they're creating, what kind of social impact they're creating. What are the few major areas you believe brands should be looking at within the next 12 months? Production. Lots of different elements to it. Now, um, the reason why I'm saying that is First of all, majority of brands and for your customers have been super um, sort of in trouble with the manufacturing because they either couldn't access it um, 
or unfortunately spoiled the relationships with manufacturers by not paying for existing orders. Um, then um, that only kind of showed to us uh, the, the vulnerability of relying on manufacturers um, across the world and not really actually building good relationships with manufacturers. Um, so we really need to start slowly, obviously that's not going to be five minutes, but slowly reframing our relationships with our manufacturers or perhaps like some of the other D2C brands deciding to make sure um, that, um, you know, that we have some level of kind of manufacturing um, secured internally. Um, and that also allows obviously to reduce the amount of uh, products being produced because majority of the time brands have to overproduce and then obviously undersell and then the rest kind of goes to waste. So those are some of the things that we definitely need to start reframing with this newfound love for our nature, which, you know, which we obviously all kind of had especially seeing dolphin in Venice, uh, in Venice, right? So uh, all this kind of view of having more air to breathe and all these bits and pieces. So we are in a right mindset to be able to start reframing some of those things. Obviously, I mentioned community is one of the strongest things that you also need to start looking at. Um, then, um, you know, the aspects of kind of really relationship building with your customers um, and more importantly, you also have a chance to really pivot your strategies and to sort of understand also things like your business models and how you sell because it's not going to rely on quantity of products anymore. Um, so you need to kind of come up with other ways, not only of added value that's included within kind of the price that the customer is paying, but also of additional services or options that allow you to earn money, but also perhaps allow you to produce less, uh, but at a considerable amount of value to your customers, because, you know, we will have to do it at the end of the day anyways. So I'm seeing some questions. Why do you love what you do? Um, okay, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so why do I love what I do? Um, Long story short, um, since I was a little kid, I was super curious about human beings and their behaviors. Uh, there's this funny story going around in uh, my family saying that when I was seven years old, I was just coming to my parents and my older sister and just asking you know, what, them why people lie. So it just didn't cross my head. I was like, why could you lie? It's like, what's kind of going on behind it? And that understanding about human beings has kind of just, trickled through my life. For me, whenever I kind of faced a situation that I couldn't understand in terms of someone's behavior or whatever else, I realized that the more I'm able to understand about them, the more I'm able to uh, kind of, you know, manage my own mindset, manage my own faults, but also are able to influence um, in some form or another, how others um, can live their life and live their life for better. And that's, you know, that's what kind of drives me every single day. I truly believe that if we take and influence brands to make them more human, to make them understand how people's minds work, we can, through their ability, through their impact that they already have, create a better world. Um, and we need to do it in a very super ethical way. So I hate working with brands that are just want to sell more. No way. Uh, not going to give you my knowledge. Bye. Uh, I'm only working with those that really kind of want to make something better. So uh, exactly. Serve, don't sell. Exactly. Because sales money is a side effect of an amazing relationship, of an amazing service. Uh, it comes naturally for, for brands that are super authentic, very ethical, uh, very socially impactful, and all these kind of bits and pieces that they actually live from, from their purpose uh, that is in one way or another enriching people's lives or enriching our planet. And that is the key. And if we start with that, money just rolls in anyway whether we realize it or not, um, because it's so aligned with who we are as human beings. 
what action might we all take today to start having more impact on others? Um, be more mindful of them, be more considerate of them. Um, ask yourself why? I'm like, that's the best question. I know it's a, it's a perfect question from a psychologist because we only ask why, but, um, but even that, I'm like, just notice someone. Oh, that's probably the best one, notice someone. We all feel more often than not invisible and especially customers, notice them, respond to them, say hello, um, appreciate, be grateful um, you know, for them. This, some of the best brands are there because they simply respond to every single comment on social media. Literally, I'm like, it's not a rocket science sometimes. We really all wanna be seen and, you know, and that's super important and celebrate some of your customers as well. Um, and celebrate definitely your employees because it's exactly the same thing. I'm like, the brands that are the strongest ones is because they also have really strong employees. Um, do you have example of brands that have really got their customers psyche right and are successful for it? Um, to a certain degree. So um, obviously Glossier was really good um, at doing that. Um, uh, Sephora is really good, actually. Um, they they really kind of drill into that. Whether they have their customer profiles super sorted out, that's hard to say, because some of the customer profiles I've seen from global companies are absolutely appalling. Uh, but as far as I, you know, seen some case studies in Sephora and Glossier, they they really got got it right. Um, and to be honest, you know, um, the rest are kind of slightly struggling um, um, and they kind of, you know, hoping for the best with all of their things because they really haven't digged into, you know, into their customers. They really kind of haven't understood the nuances um, in there. And those nuances are what gives you the competitive advantage across other brands. Now, um, was there any other question that I missed? No, I think. I think that was it. It's funny that you mentioned Glossier because I was like a first time customer just a couple months ago. And something had gone wrong with my order. I think it was my fault. And I emailed them and it was just one of those moments of like, oh God damn it, now I need to email them. And they just got back immediately. Like that thing about saying just feel noticed, like they got back within like two minutes. Like I didn't understand how someone could even be responsive that quick because it was definitely, it was a specific question about my address and it wasn't a robot. It didn't seem like maybe I was fooled, but it just, I immediately, like I was a returning customer. I loved them. And I always say that I love Glossier now just because of that one feeling of like, oh, they noticed me, they responded. So it's really interesting. Yeah, you see, I'm like such a simple little thing, right? Yeah. I'm like, it just, it really isn't that difficult. It's just about kind of building a must have policy almost, you know, and making sure that you have the team to do it and to respond to it. And then they know that they have to respond all the time. And there's literally just people Another thing that, that also always annoys me is that you're being passed around from person to person yeah. and they're all saying the bloody same automatic thing and it's just like, ah, yeah, that's not really what I want. Um, so, you know, so having actual humans or if you're really super huge, you can also really build an amazing AI enabled um, robot, uh, you know, the, the chatbot and things like that which actually has, uh, can have your brand personality subscribed to it. And also, for example, can use things like IBM Watson, which is able to understand your personality and your emotional state from the words you are using. So it's also adjusting the way it's responding to you while you're having a conversation. So those things are available and they're becoming better and better. I'm not saying that tech is perfect. I'm like majority of tech and algorithms in terms of behavioral things are rubbish. And, um, you know, they not barely understanding 5% of our human beings. Come on, we don't even understand majority of our brain uh, yet. Um, but the more you have that kind of human input on your brand, uh, the better it really gets. And sometimes those things can be super simple, but super effective, like that thing, respond fast. Um, and it's, you know, it works. Honestly, it works. Totally. That was so fascinating. Thank you so much, Kay. I think we should leave it there. And thank you for everyone for joining as well. I found that super valuable. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your amazing questions. And feel free to drop me a note on any social media or anything like that. You can quite easily um, find me at Style Psychology. So, or 
Kate Nightingale on LinkedIn. Honestly, happy to respond to any other additional questions that might pop out later into your head. Um, thank you so much. Honestly, ha have all the best and good luck with all of your brands and everything that you're doing. It was a, honestly a pleasure. Take care. Bye.